Hey everyone, I'm Sarah and welcome to the very first video in a series where I'm going to show you how I take my watercolor artwork and turn it into repeating patterns using Photoshop. I'm going to be showing you how I take my paintings, like this one, and turn them into patterns that can be used on things like fabric, home decor, wallpaper, textiles, gift wrap, and so much more. And here's another example of some beta fish that I painted and turned into a lovely repeating pattern. And I'll be showing you how to do this today. So throughout this series, I'm going to walk you through every step from painting to bringing your artwork into Photoshop to removing that watercolor paper background and retouching your artwork and then finally creating a repeating pattern. I'm also going to show you a little bit about how to recolor your artwork in Photoshop which despite what you might hear from a lot of people it's totally possible and it's not that hard. So in today's video we're going to be focusing on the very first steps of this process which include painting with pattern making in mind and then bringing your artwork into Photoshop using a scanner or even your phone. So with that let's jump right into it by talking about the supplies that we're going to need to create repeating patterns in Photoshop. So I have some good news for you, which is that it really doesn't matter what art supplies you use to create your artwork. Use whatever you prefer. So today I'm going to be talking about watercolor. I do most of my artwork using watercolor or gouache, but if you are a colored pencil artist or you prefer to use markers, or even if you work in a software like Procreate or something like that, that is all totally fine. Another beautiful thing about creating these repeating patterns in Photoshop is that you don't necessarily need the highest quality top shelf materials because we don't care so much about the preservation of this artwork. We're gonna scan it and digitize it and it's gonna live on your computer. And so even if your artwork fades over time, for example, it's gonna remain totally intact on your computer. Now, for those of you who would prefer some more specifics than that, I personally use a kind of wide range of supplies across a range of different prices. But personally, I think that the paper is the most important part. In today's video, I'm gonna be using Arches hot pressed 140 pound or 300 GSM watercolor paper. I also also often use Arches cold press paper. They both are great at different things, but these are pretty high end and you totally do not need to use expensive paper for this. I've made lots of my patterns using something like the Canson XL watercolor paper, which is way cheaper. You can get a pad of 30 pages for like $6 or something like that. And those are some of my favorite patterns. So really, really just use what works best for you, what feels right for you. And I promise it'll work just fine. In terms of my paints, I mostly use these Art Philosophy watercolor palettes, I find they're a pretty good quality for a relatively low to medium price range. And I find myself coming back again and again to the same color palette. In particular, I use the Essence palette. It's the very first one that I bought and I love it so much. I have also used the same brush like forever. <laughs> These are the Silver Brush Black Velvet series and I honestly use the size four like more than anything. I think if I had a size six, I would probably use that as my number one. The four can sometimes be just a little bit small, but I've got the zero, two, four, and eight. And the eight is just a little bit too big for most of my needs, but they're really great brushes and they've held up really well over the year or so that I've been using them pretty regularly. So if you are interested in any of the supplies that I'm using, or if you just want to check them out, I have included a link below to all of these different supplies. So in addition to what we're going to need to create the actual artwork, we're also going to need some supplies to bring that artwork into Photoshop. So if you're serious about this whole pattern making thing, I would definitely recommend looking into getting a scanner. Now I will caveat this by saying you do not need anything super fancy. I remember I was doing a ton of research on scanners before I bought one, but in the end I bought something pretty simple. It's a Canon Lead A 300 that I got for $35 on Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> so this scanner has been great for me. It's worked very well for my needs. So if you are interested in looking at this specific scanner, I will also put a link to that below. But really, I do recommend that you look around at places like Facebook Marketplace or OfferUp or something like that just to find an inexpensive photo scanner. Just make sure that they can scan at a pretty high resolution. So we're going to get into this a little bit later. You want at least 300 DPI. I often scan at higher than that. DPI means dots per inch. You may also see PPI, that's pixels or points per inch. This is just a measure of how detailed of a scan your scanner can achieve. When we're working in Photoshop, oftentimes scanning at a higher resolution is going to help you out a lot. So if you're just starting out and you don't have a scanner or something like that, don't worry, you can 100% use your phone. This is how I started and it totally worked for me at the beginning. Now, of course, there are a couple caveats that you're likely not going to be able to get the same resolution or the same quality of a scan that you would get if you were to use a scanner. But for learning 
learning purposes, it totally works fine just to use your phone. Later in the video, we'll go through some of the tips that I have for getting a good picture that you can use to create a pattern in Photoshop. So those are all the supplies that you're gonna need. And with that, let's just jump right into the actual painting process. So the beauty of this whole process is that there really is room for every single type of art style or technique that you could use. And so in today's video, I'm not gonna be teaching you how to paint, but I'm gonna walk you through some of the tips that I've picked up over time that's gonna help you optimize your artwork for pattern making. So the first tip that I have is to just tell a consistent color story. So for me, the best way that I've learned this has been to really limit the color palette that I use for every painting that's destined for a pattern. In some cases, this means using as few as has two colors and that's it up to a maximum of maybe six but I think if you're just starting out limiting your color palette is really gonna help you create a pattern that's cohesive and that flows together really well so before you start your actual painting I definitely recommend painting a few color swatches just to see how your different colors flow together and see if you like that combination my next tip is to paint at a reasonable scale now I know this is a kind of nebulous vague rule here and that's just it it's not really a hard and fast rule reasonable could fall within a kind of a wide range. But since we're working in Photoshop, it does mean we're working with rasters. Now, if you don't know what that is, don't worry, that's not gonna stop you from doing any of this. But basically with rasters, as you make them bigger and bigger and bigger, they're gonna get more and more blurry or pixelated. And so if your initial artwork is a little bit bigger, you're gonna have a little bit more wiggle room when it comes to increasing the size in Photoshop. Also worth mentioning though is that that's all well and good, but I tend to paint kind of small and it's been okay so far. You might hear people say maybe something like the size of the palm of your hand would be a good baseline, but I often paint way smaller than that. And it's worked out for me, so don't worry too much, but I would avoid painting anything super teeny tiny because that's just not gonna give you a ton of wiggle room when we get into Photoshop. My third painting tip is to not overthink it. I definitely still fall into this trap of kind of overthinking things and creating really complicated patterns sometimes. But the truth is, sometimes the simplest patterns are the cutest. For example, take designers like Aaron Kendall, who use really simple simple shapes to create these adorable patterns that I love so much. So don't feel like you have to create some masterpiece because it turns out you might actually like the polka dots better in the end. So now moving into a little bit more technical tips about the actual painting process, this next step is to pay attention to the light colors that you're using. Basically, the closer the color is to the color of your watercolor paper, it might be a little bit harder to separate those two things out when we get into Photoshop. Don't stress about this one too much because if having those light colors is really part of your style or if you really want it for a particular painting, no worries. I am a firm believer that we can really do and fix anything in Photoshop. So if you want to keep those light colors, go for it. It might just add a couple extra minutes to your processing time in Photoshop and that's totally okay. Another practical tip is to try as best as you can to keep your paper clean. Now this is one that's for me way easier said than done. For example, I have three cats and they are really obsessed with watercolor. Like truly anytime I get my watercolor colors out, my cats are like attracted like a magnet and they'll come running. So I often deal with kitty paws across my paper and cat hairs everywhere that I have to pick out of my paintings and that's just a reality. But as much as you can, the cleaner you can keep your paper, the easier it's going to be later on in Photoshop. So another painting tip is to not forget about your filler elements. So we can really easily get sucked into the main motifs, that's what we call the primary kind of objects in our patterns, but oftentimes the really important part of a pattern is all of the little filler things that go in between those bigger motifs. You don't need these necessarily. This could cause you to fall into that realm of maybe overcomplicating things, but in some cases it helps to have some little blobs or poor little squiggles or things like that that you might be able to use to fill in some blank spaces on your pattern later on the line. This is kind of a muscle that you're gonna work the more patterns that you make. You're gonna get a better sense of what kind of filler elements you're gonna need based on your style, what you think looks good, and so don't stress about it too much at the beginning. So now that the painting is totally done, the next step is just to let it dry completely, and then we're gonna move on to scanning or photographing. So once you've completed your artwork, there are a couple ways you can move that artwork from the real world into your computer. So if you're just getting started, you might just have your phone and that's totally fine. And I'll walk you through some tips for using your phone. But I'm also gonna show you my preferred method, which is to use a scanner. A couple tips for using your phone. Firstly, lighting is definitely the most important thing. You'll often hear people say that natural light is a big winner and I totally agree. The main thing here is that you wanna make sure the lighting accurately represents the colors that you actually painted or drew 
or whatever. So that means keep your painting out of direct sunlight or in heavily shadowed areas. You also want to make sure that your phone and your artwork are parallel to each other. So make sure your painting isn't tilted one way or another and the same goes for your phone. You want to make sure you're getting a pretty flat plane when you're taking that picture. Sometimes this might mean propping up your painting to get the best lighting that's out of direct light and then holding your phone accordingly so that it is parallel to that artwork. A good way to check this is to make sure the top and the bottom and then the left and right sides of your artwork look parallel to the top and the bottom and the left and the right of your actual phone screen. So if you're noticing that one of those sides is cutting through the edge of your screen or something like that, readjust until you get it just right. This sounds easy, but it's something that can take a little bit of finicking. So just play with it until you're satisfied with the picture that you've gotten. So when it comes to scanning my artwork, there's a couple things that I do to prep. Firstly, I'll take that clean flat brush and just wipe off my painting to get any hairs or dust or anything off. This is going to save me some time down the line. I also take a little bit of glass cleaner and just wipe down my scanner before every time I use it because no matter how clean I think it should be, there's always some kind of hair or dust or something that makes its way in there. So it's always great to start with a clean slate. In terms of actual scanning software, I just use what's built into my MacBook Pro. So if you go into your settings and scroll all the way down to printers and scanners, just click that and then I click on my scanner once it's plugged in. When you open that up, it'll show you an overview of what's laying on the scanner bed. And I just make sure that I've selected color. I scan my artwork at a really high resolution. So I use 1200 DPI, which is giant. That's huge. And that does mean that you're gonna have huge file sizes if you scan that large. I use an external solid state drive to store all of my pattern making files. And so if you have something like that, this method totally works fine. And it's gonna give you a ton of flexibility in terms of how large you can scale your patterns going forward. But if you don't have a lot of storage to play with, no worries, it's totally fine to scan at a lower resolution. Just make sure you're scanning at at least 300 DPI. Anything lower than 300 DPI is gonna mean that your painting is gonna look pretty pixelated and you're not gonna have very much wiggle room. I scan in as a TIFF, but you can also use things like JPEGs and other file formats. Then I specify where I want my file to go once it's scanned and then what I want that file to be named. And then you can define the actual portion of that artwork that you want to be scanned by clicking and dragging to draw a marquee around that desired area. This particular painting is too big to be scanned all at once. That's totally fine. I'm just gonna repeat this process again to create two scans and I'll show you how to merge those in Photoshop if you're in a similar situation. A quick tip on your file management. It's taken me some time to sort out a system that I think works best for me and here's what I do. I create a folder for every pattern or pattern collection that I'm working on. So we're gonna assume that you're working on a standalone pattern. So in this case, your main folder will be called something related to that pattern. For me, we might call it forest floor or something like that. Inside that file, I'll create a few additional files that'll help me organize everything that I'm gonna need. First, I'll create one called raw scans. This is where I'm gonna scan in the actual artwork. Next, I'm gonna create a folder called PS files. That's for Photoshop files. So that's where I'm gonna save all of the actual working files that I'm creating in Photoshop. My third folder is gonna be called exports. So when it comes to actually exporting my completed patterns, I'm gonna save them all into this folder so I easily know where they all are. And my fourth folder I'll call mockups. And so this is for any mockups that I create using this pattern that I've created throughout the rest of this folder. I'm not gonna go into mockups too much in, in this series, but I just wanted you to know that that's really how I organize my files. And I would totally recommend that you do something similar or find a system that works for you. All right, so that brings us to the end of the first video in this series. Series. So in this video, I've shown you the materials that I use, the tips that I have for actually creating your artwork, and then how to bring that artwork into your computer using your phone or your scanner. The next video is going to be focused on bringing that artwork into Photoshop and removing the watercolor background so that you can play with each of those motifs on their own. And we're also going to talk about touching up your artwork so that it looks as close to what it looks like in the real world after you bring it into your computer. If you have any questions about anything that I covered in this video, definitely let me know below and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And don't be afraid to ask a question because I bet if you have it, other people might have it too. So it's a great space to kind of learn together. So to make sure you don't miss out on that next video in this series, please subscribe to my channel and I'll be releasing it super, super soon. In the meantime, you might be interested in this video right here where I talk about the progress that I've made in this whole pattern making journey that I've been on from my very first month all the way through the seventh month, which I just wrapped up. So with that, thank you very much and I will see you very soon. Take care, everyone.